am delighted to say that I am joined by football journalist and broadcaster Lars Sivertson. How are you doing, Lars? I am excellent. How are you this evening? I am doing very well. Did you have a nice Christmas? Yeah, well, yeah, it was good. It was good. It's um, I'm having this feeling now that it's very... I'm, I'm not entirely sure what day it is and what's going on. It's these very confusing couple of days just after Boxing Day, before New Year's Eve, where, where, where your whole body and system and schedule is uh, uh, a little bit chaotic. <laughs> well, what I did say when I was coming on the show tonight was that uh, if you're looking for what day of the week it is, I cannot help you. But I can tell you there was a lot of football on. So <laughs> yes. maybe we'll, we'll concentrate on that. We won't confuse anyone else with our own confusion. <laughs> um, how have you felt about the, the run into the Premier League? It seems like we haven't had much of a break between that and the World Cup but I think the Carabao Cup action last week really did whet people's appetites to go straight back into the league starting up again well I have to be completely honest I was a little bit sort of I I mean I watched every game of the World Cup bar one uh, so so after the World Cup, I have to admit my sort of football brain was kind of, I, I wouldn't have minded a longer break, to be honest with you. And usually we do have that uh, when, when there's a summer tournament. Going straight on, it was, was very strange. And I remember the Carabao Cup games happening and they were just kind of, I was struggling to connect with it. It was like they were happening on my television, but I wasn't really sort of, <laughs> it felt kind of unreal. But then, of course, you get to Boxing Day, and Boxing Day is such a strong tradition. Uh, you're so used to, you know, it's the day after Christmas Day, and 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 all the football comes around, and that sort of, yeah, that that felt familiar. That felt like the way it's meant to be, and and in a weird way, the, the way the games played out kind of helped. Uh, is certainly for me to to get my mind back into it because we we've been thinking so much about, you know, what effect will the World Cup have? What will it mean that we have this massive break in the middle of the season? Well, it turns out for a lot of teams, it was just we were straight back where we were. It was a lot of the same things that were happening before the tournament uh, happened now uh, with, with with several of the of the teams. Well, you talk about a lot of things that happened before the break happening now again, and we saw Tottenham continue the <laughs> chaos that is Tottenham. I think it was you that said that if uh, if just the second half counted for matches in the Premier League, Tottenham would be was it first or something? <laughs> yes, they would. If if only things that happened between the forty sixth and the ninetieth minute counted, if we make a separate league table for second halves, Tottenham would actually be top of that league. Now, of course, an important caveat to that is. Some of the other teams, you know, Arsenal, Man City, haven't had to try quite so hard to win the second half because they haven't constantly been behind, which is the problem Tottenham have. And again, that was we uh, first game we saw in the Premier League after the World Cup. You're thinking, oh, will will and will many things have changed now? You know, how will it affect? Well, it's, it, Tottenham is exactly the same. They, they were absolutely dreadful in the in the second half, and it, it looked like they needed to concede a couple of goals to to, to wake them up. It, it, it's very very strange. I I do wonder. It's happened so many times now. It, it, it must. It, it can't be um, unintentional in the sense that I'm. I'm. I'm 99 certain they are. They set out to try to not take too many risks in the first half. You know, to try to keep it tight. Uh, try to n- not let games get out of control. Try not to do anything stupid. And then the intention is to sort of turn the screw a little bit in the second half. I'm just think. I, I just don't see any evidence that Tottenham are capable of, of not doing anything stupid in the first half if that's how they set <laughs> up. There's too much stupidity. You know, there's An outbreak of stupidity is never too far away from this defence. And, and so they keep having to chase the game. I think it's the ninth game in a row where they fell behind. Like, this isn't good. You you can't keep doing this. Now, I'm not, listen, I'm not going to sit on my sofa here and, and sort of try to mansplain football to Antonio Conte. That would be stupid. He clearly knows a lot more about this than I do. But but how long are we going to try to do the same thing with this team? Because it's clearly they they can't do that. Whereas when Tottenham have to attack, when they have to go on the front foot, there's so much quality in that team going forward that inevitably they do get goals, right? So I, I don't know. May I humbly suggest that perhaps it's time to try it the other way around. Maybe try to attack from the start and and, and, and try to get one or two goals and then see how, how, where we go. Instead, in, in, in spite of this sort of, let's just wait and see if, if something happens. Well, I was going to ask, where do you think the actual issue is in that? Because is it, like Conte, as you say, he has to be looking at this and saying, okay, there have been nine games where we are the first ones to go down. That is not a good record for a Premier League team that consider themselves like contenders for a Champions League spot. I won't say contenders for the league, so it's it's been a while for that one. But mm-hmm. 
do, is it that the players just aren't capable of getting themselves into gear in the first 45 minutes and he's saying to them we need we need something more or is it that as you say he is happy to let them kind of almost sit back in the first half and is happy in the knowledge that they can come out in the second half and pull it off because I, I don't see how a manager like Antonio Conte would be particularly happy that his team has 45 minutes to come out and as you say score a couple of goals no, no, you're exactly right. And I, at the beginning, we, we, we tended to think that when this kept happening is that, well, they've started badly, Conte has shouted at them at halftime, and now they're playing better. But, but it's happened almost throughout the entire season. Even games they've won, they've often been quite sort of slow and underwhelming in the first half. So at, at this point, it can't be a coincidence. It, it really can't. It, I certainly don't think it is. And I wonder if so there's a bit of context here with Antonio Conte is that he is... Um, He's a manager who 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 likes he likes control and he wants his teams to to be in control. He doesn't want games to be chaotic. That doesn't necessarily mean he wants to have the ball all the time, but he wants them to have a very solid structure. He doesn't want the 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 game to sort of go back and forth in waves and the way we often kind of like in England these sort of crazy box to box encounters. He wants his team to be in control, and it's 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 funny because. His last two jobs, I mean, it's this job, and before that, he was in charge at Inter in Italy. And Inter are, there's a slight parallel to Tottenham. I mean, they're more successful, of course, but they also, like Tottenham, have a reputation for being slightly chaotic. You know, Pazza Inter, the crazy Inter is their nickname, and that's even in one of their club anthems. Uh, and, and he came in there, and he, he he banned that anthem for a while because he wanted them to be not crazy. He wanted them to be sensible and organized and 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 more rational. And, and he was successful in that and eventually won the league with them. I, you get the sense that he's almost trying to do a similar thing with Tottenham. He's trying to make them more mechanical, more 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 solid, less of this sort of expansive, chaotic football that even, you know, even with even with Tottenham when they were good under Antonio Conte, they, they were always a little bit sort of unhinged. You know? And Dejan Kulusevski, the Swedish player, has said in, in, in an interview in Sweden that you know, Conte has told them that, that that football shouldn't be fun. You know, you shouldn't be having fun. You should be working hard. Well, Tottenham, are, as a club, historically, are, are, are even even when they've been really well organized, it's always been a risk of fun breaking out. Uh, he's trying to make them more rational, solid instruction. But it just isn't working. You know, I just I wonder how many games. I'm not sure they have the play, the defenders who are capable of just shutting up shop for, for half a game and then turning it on because they, they always look so vulnerable. Whereas again, like I said, when they do attack, they always look very dangerous. So how, I wonder how long, it, it, maybe it becomes the issue of stubbornness. So maybe he has to accept that we can't really do it this way. Or maybe there needs to be a change of personnel the, defensively. But that kind of big wholesale changes are difficult to do halfway through a season. And another team who kind of picked up where they left off was Newcastle's 3-0 win over Leicester. And it's funny, I was saying this to the lads earlier just before you came on, I feel like with Newcastle, everyone knew they were doing really well this season, but it seems like just after the World Cup, suddenly people have looked at the table and gone, huh, they're in second place. But okay, yes, they have a couple of games in hand, but are they actually title contenders? Because before, everyone was pretty much like, City are probably going to win it, Arsenal are up there. And there wasn't really all that many other faces in contention, but it really feels like Newcastle could do something this season if they keep this sort of form up. Yeah, well, if they if they keep winning, there, there's uh, there's every chance. I mean, no, it was a there's a fine uh, win against Leicester City, uh, and there's it's it's no fluke that they're up there. If you look at like underlying numbers, like expected goals and sort of shots for and against and all this sort of stuff, there's no sort of weird fluky coincidental uh, lucky nonsense that they're up there. They they, they really have been uh, the third best team in the division. Uh, they deserve to be up there. They're, they're they 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 hardly concede goals. I mean, they're they're very well organized, and you watch them and you get such a strong sense of everyone knowing what their job is and uh, and they're very very impressive you, you do wonder if they have the depth to to, to keep uh, keep the pace with the, with city and arsenal as the season goes on uh, that's something that uh, you, you it's an easy thing to say, obviously, but I, I, it's, I find it harder to imagine that this will keep on. There's more of a sense that Eddie Howe is getting the absolute maximum out of this group of players right now and that they're on great form and have great momentum, but that there will be setbacks because in terms of quality, to, to my mind, certainly they are a, a little bit short of, of the very best teams in the league. On this game, though, 
I have to say, I really felt for for Brendan Rodgers, which isn't something. I mean, Brendan Rodgers is a slightly divisive character. He's uh, he, he's a very confident man, seems to be. There are quite a lot of people who uh, who, who find him difficult to warm to. But but whatever you you, you think of him, like he will have spent uh, the last few weeks and uh, the time during the World Cup looking very very carefully at his team. You know, they didn't have a great first half to the season. Things were looking up a little bit, but it's clear that uh, things weren't quite working for them. And he'll have thought, okay, what can we do? Like, what, is there anything? we can do differently is there a shape a structure stuff we can do we'll work on stuff and training and you play the first game and you have like, okay it's it's newcastle it's not easy but it could be could be doable and then you can see like the, the dumbest penalty imaginable after like two minutes and you're one nil down and then this sort of red hot unstoppable miguel almiron makes it too it, it, after seven minutes and you think wow okay this is not this is not going to be a good boxing day for brendan so th- it, it was one of those games that newcastle got it completely into their track you know two nil up early on they're well organized they, they know what they do they're, they're about and they could just kind of sit back and uh, actually weren't quite as as uh, they didn't press quite as high as they've done in other games this season it, it became very very comfortable for them you mentioned Almer on there and he's one of the players that has really stood out this season. And I feel some people are slightly taken by surprise by this, but I watched him a few times in the MLS for my sins in a, in yes. a previous role. And uh, he's kind of playing similarly to how he did at Atlanta. And you're like, I think whatever whatever it is about what Eddie Howe has managed to capture in him, he's managed, managed to recapture the sort of form he was in at that time. I am really glad you said that because that, I mean, people think I'm crazy when I say this, but it's a couple of years ago. So around about 2018, uh, Atlanta United and, and MLS were, were genuinely one of the most fun team to watch in the world, coached by uh, by the now Mexico, well, the former Mexico coach, Tata Martino, who is a kind of Bielsa-inspired in, guy. So there's really high press, send a lot of people forwards. Anyone, everyone's running all the time. It, a little bit like watching Leeds the season they got promoted for the championship. I mean, that kind of vibe. Uh, winning the ball high up the pitch all the time. A lot of people are pressing. And Almiron was absolutely key to that team, you know, both in terms of regaining the ball. You know, he, he always has a lot of energy, but also both pulling the strings and, and scoring goals uh, in that team. He was so, so good. And of course, listen, there's, there's some goofy defenders in MLS. Like, it's not quite the same level as as the Premier League. So some drop-off you would expect. But, but for me, the key has always been that he went from a team that had the ball a lot, that often spent time around the opposing box. And then he went to Newcastle, who under Rafa Benitez, and then especially under Steve Bruce, did not have the ball very often. Like he had to spend an awful lot of his time and energy defending. Uh, and and when they did have the ball, whenever he got the ball, he usually would get it like in his own half or certainly very far away from goal. So you had to, if he wanted to get it close to the goal, he had to do a lot of hard work himself. And he just wasn't getting on a very basic level, not the same amount of touches in and around the opponent's box. And for an attacking player, that makes it really difficult because instead of having you know, several chances a game to do something, you have maybe one or two chances a game to do something if you're lucky. And I, I think that can also affect your confidence because you know, if you, you have a slightly bad touch or something, if you're playing for a team that plays quite dominant attacking football and you have a lot of opportunities, okay, you have a bad touch, right? sad but the team's going to win the ball back and you're going to get another chance in a couple of minutes when you were playing for steve bruce's newcastle i mean that, that might be the one time you had a chance to do anything in that game and the next time you get a chance to to do something around the box again is next week so i think it's just like mentally that must be really tough for an attacking player and he just looks so much happier now uh playing for this eddie howe team who are also it really suits his qualities as well that they're pressing high up the field the way they have done most of the time under Eddie Howe because his energy is uh, he's he's really well suited for that. Yeah, there definitely is a category of people that the minute you say someone performed well in the MLS, they ter- they turn their nose up at it. But if you look at some of the players coming over in the last few years and the level that they're competing at, like okay, yes, we all know it's not the top league in the world, but there are their gems there, and there are the teams that can play that really really nice free flowing football it's well i suppose especially over here in ireland the timing isn't always great for people to watch all that much of it but it's definitely unfair to just say just because you played in the mls it, it isn't just a retirement village there are actually yeah. young players that are really great there and um, no, there's been a real there's been a real change of emphasis over there i think more and more uh, clubs are realizing there that it's more exciting for their fans if they play good football uh, compared to just like bringing really old Europeans over all the time. So there's there's, there's a real sort of shift towards 
bring in younger South American players in rather than sort of mid thirties Europeans. Uh, but, but 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 also I think with Almiron, and and uh, there's actually similar things can be said about the sort of resurgence of Joelinton in that team. We tend to forget, and we're very guilty of this in the media, when a player isn't playing well, we'll look at what position and what role he's playing in the team and what kind of football that team is playing compared to what he's used to. Joe Ellington was never a sort of a, a number nine for Hoffenheim in Germany. He was never a lone striker. He was used in a sort of wide forward role for a team who pressed a lot, and he used all that energy he has to, to chase the opponents and win the ball high up the field. And again, he was brought to Newcastle and was was plowing a very lonely furrow up front uh, for a team that hardly ever had the ball. He looked completely lost, and he was written off, and people made fun of him. But if you take a player out of a system and put them into a completely different system, sometimes you get different results. Definitely, and you talk about players not performing to a certain level there, and it feels like the perfect segue into Liverpool 3, mm. Aston Villa 1, and... The big topic of conversation the last while being Darwin Nunez and the signing of Cody Gakpo and what that means for him and what it means for Liverpool in general because I think most people would say they probably don't need another attacking player. They need someone in midfield unless some of the injuries in the attack are a bit more long-term than we actually expected. Mm. How did you feel when you saw the signing of Gakpo come in and do you think this is uh, Klopp thinking, I'm going to bring a young player in and maybe transition him a little bit and change how he plays? or do you think this is him just reinforcing the attack? It's an interesting question. Uh, I I did scratch my head a little bit because uh, Cody Gakpo, he did play notionally up front for, for Holland during the World Cup, but it was a very sort of wide uh, role. He often dropped uh, out into the left-hand side. And he is... Uh, He's played most of his games uh, in, in Holland on the left, and he is a typical sort of uh, right-footed player who likes to start out on the left and then cut inside and and use his very, very good right foot to either shoot or, or play passes or, or crosses. He strikes the ball very cleanly. Uh, and uh, he, he, if you just watch sort of highlights videos, you might get a little bit confused because he's very tall, and people tend to think, ah, tall, must be striker. But he's, he's not really that sort of big physical uh, presence he just happens he's he's a winger who happens to be quite tall um and and, he, and i have to say if you look at the liverpool squad if everyone's fit uh, a sort of technical uh, good sort of left-sided forward who likes to cut in on his right kind of have a few of those already don't they you know you, you'd think they re-signed Mohamed Salah to a new big contract so he's going to play on the right for the foreseeable future he spent a lot of money on Darwin Nunez uh, I suppose we can talk more about him later but I, I think they're going to give him every chance to thrive up front after that sort of outlay it be, would be quite daft to not do that and that leaves that left side of space which to be fair, is where Cody Gapko uh, thrives. But there you have you have Diaz and you have Diogo Jota there. Now, both of those are injured right now. So right now, having Gapko in is good. And and, I, and, I, and you touch upon it, maybe that they're signing another player in that position suggests that mm, maybe one of those injuries are, are a little bit bad. That that could be that could be a thing. We, we don't really know. Clubs do obviously keep that sort of information close to the chest. But but it's also a case with Gapko is that he is still pretty young. He has a lot of qualities. It's it's possible they want to mold him into something slightly different. One thing I have been thinking more and more about, if you look at his sort of numbers from the Air Divise in Holland. Again, you take it with a bit of a pinch of salt. I mean, there's a long and proud record of attacking players who have been amazing in the Eredivisie and struggled to adapt to a higher level, as well as, you know, other ones who have adapted and been very good. So you look at the numbers and you think, yeah, okay. But one thing I've noticed is he does hit a lot of crosses in. Uh, he, he puts a lot of crosses into the box, or at least did for his previous team. And I think when you have Darwin Nunez, and one of the things you really want to is get the best out of him, I think, you know, more crosses into the box could be the way because he is a real presence and someone who can attack the, those kind of deliveries. One final one I wanted to ask you about before we wrap up was Manchester United. And obviously they were also in the running for Cody Gakpo. But uh, Eric Ten Hag said in his programme notes before the game that fifth is the right position for us. And I thought that was interesting especially if he was looking ahead to the rest of the season because obviously, you know, Champions League football is going to be fairly important for them. They they need a few players to come in. They don't have a lot of money in that regard, so the Champions League position would also help them in that regard. Do you agree with Ten Hag in fifth being right position for United this season? Well, maybe based on what they've done so far this season, but you have to remember they started 
really badly. And it's been a tough sort of transition from whatever it was they were trying to do before to playing the way Ericsson Haig wants them to do. It took them a while to fully integrate Casemiro into the team. They had the whole Cristiano Ronaldo circus, uh, which was obviously must have been a distraction for them and, and a problem. That's been cleared up, obviously. He's on his way. Uh, and, and, and you see Casemiro now fully integrated in that uh, team. It makes a huge difference in midfield. So... Uh, fifth it might be just about right for what they've done so far but I'm, I'm kind of positive about United going forward I know it was just Nottingham Forest they played against uh, at home and you should always win win that but they look you know Casemiro gives them a solidity in midfield they haven't had for years and and having Eriksen next to him again he's such an intelligent passer of the ball and and it just in terms of their build-up play it gives them I mean, the difference between that and the whole McFred issue is uh, it, it's it's massive you know they look so much better on Gakko with United, like I understand if you're a United fan and he's a good player, you've seen the highlight videos, you saw him score during the World Cup, you've been linked loads of times, he's from the same country as the manager, you're sort of emotionally thinking, okay, this this is one for us. And then he ends up going to your bitter rivals. You know, that, that's frustrating, I understand that. But again with Gakko, I know he's referred to as a forward, but his position is as a left-sided player who comes in onto his right foot, that that's what he does. And at United, I mean, first of all, that's that's Marcus Rashford's best position, undoubtedly. Possibly also Martial's best position. I mean, you play him up front, but he's also someone who likes in, the, in that sort of left-hand space, cutting into his right foot. And I also think you've, you've spent $100 million on Anthony, so he's going to play on the right for, for a while, uh, and <laughs> unless something weird happens. So if you're going to get anything out of Jadon Sancho, that left wing is probably the spot you're going to try to, to make something happen for him. So again, another player in that sort of space. I'm not sure that makes sense for United, at least not when there are slightly limited funds and when there's a desperate, desperate need for, for a more obvious sort of number nine up top because that they have no one there. Sounds like the general trend at the moment is uh, club signing players that we're not entirely sure they need for particular <laughs> positions. <laughs> if you <Shiny>. were, <laughs> if you were to see United bring someone in and maybe like push a bit more for that top four position, who, what sort of player and from which club would you like to see them? Obviously, we do have the money issue at United, and you're looking at the fact that they can't really sign even Yao Felix for like 22 million for six months and that's too expensive for them so the options are pretty mm. limited they may they might have to go over to the MLS or something and do do a little <laughs> shopping for someone on the cheaper side <laughs> uh, well they, they, they like a few other clubs in the world they're looking for a number nine and 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 there is a shortage of sort of out and out forwards I mean during the World Cup coverage I lost track of how many times I said well this team would be really good if they had a striker like I mean there is a real shortage of, of that sort of just a uh, an old-fashioned number nine who wins, who can win the aerial challenges, who's a presence in the box, who can hold the ball up. I mean, what United really want to do is, is kidnap Giroud and shove him into a time machine and sort of de-age him by about 10 years. That would be amazing. I mean, that sort of player is what I think uh, you, you'd want for United. And I actually think United doesn't, they don't even need to sign a, a number nine who scores 100 bazillion goals because they have so many good attacking players. If you bring someone in who can be a good focal point and again do the kind of job Giroud has done for, for France you will get a lot of goals out of Rashford you'll get goals out of Bruno Fernandes you'll get goals out of whether it's Anthony who plays or, or maybe uh, you know Jaden Sancho comes in there are tons of goals in that team but they do need some kind of reference point up front I think maybe Martial can sort of develop into that if he can stay fit for once but you always worry about his injury record and not even totally sure he's that kind of player so a, a good old fashioned striker I think is is the priority number one for United and, and for my for my money I don't even think he needs to be a world beater I just he needs he, he needs to do the sort of traditional striker things and sadly that wasn't under the Christmas tree for Eric Ten Hag but we will see what comes in January Lars it was brilliant talking to you have a lovely evening anytime uh, football on Off the Ball is brought to you by Sky. Don't miss Leeds versus Manchester United tonight live on Premier Sports. That's kicking off at 8 o'clock. We will be with you just after these ads. Off the Ball on News Talk.